summer and happy 2023 to all you royals, rebels, and romantics out there. This episode, we're looking back at some of the memorable moments in 2022 and some of our favorite things. Welcome, everyone, and happy, happy, happy new year. We are thrilled that you are joining us again in 2023. I want to thank you so much for listening. A big shout out to all of you listeners. Welcome to new listeners. Thank you. Thank you to longtime listeners and a huge and special shout out and thank you to my wonderful patrons who make Royals, Rebels and Romantics possible. I couldn't do it without your support. I want to thank all of you for your support. I thought, as we have in the past, it might be kind of fun to look back on the momentous year 2022. As Tracy Borman shared with us, 2022 will turn out to have been a pivotal and very important year in the monarchy. So first off, I thought we'd just sort of look back over some of the key events in that year. We'll start in February because it was on February 6th. 2022 that we celebrated or marked the 70th anniversary of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's accession to the throne. And so that happened way at the first of the year, February 6th. And of course, the Jubilee celebrations were just beginning, but that day is important and must have been a pretty interesting day for the Queen. Now, of course, as is true, I think, of all of 2022, and in fact, the last couple of years, there can't be good without some bad as well. And so, even for the Queen herself, also in February, Prince Andrew, and honestly, we have not talked about Prince Andrew and his um, issues and problems and, you know, pretty amazing errors, but he did reach an out-of-court settlement that month in his sexual assault claim. So it was an important month and an important month in terms of his status within the family as the queen took some additional titles away. Also in February, the queen tested positive for COVID-19. So again, February, like the year, certainly had highs and lows. But let's move on to some more highs really quickly. On the 17th of May, the Queen visited Paddington Station. It's a train station, an underground station. I know I've spent quite a bit of time there. But she was there on the 17th of May to mark the opening of the Elizabeth Line, which was opening in conjunction with the Platinum Jubilee. And so um, hopefully if you live in London, you've had a chance to ride on the Elizabeth Line or maybe you'll join it. The Underground's wonderful and that's a new line this year in honor of the Queen. Then in June, all of the Jubilee events occurred, the big, large, wonderful celebrations. So on the 2nd of June, starting off, the Queen attended the Trooping of the Color, and she lit the first Platinum Jubilee beacon, and that was at Windsor Castle. And I know when we talked about this at the past, the notion of beacons are celebratory, but they also have a, a hint or a history of being a warning. So during the time of the Armada, there were beacons set up all over. And so a beacon is a very interesting symbol. And there were beautiful beacons lit throughout the country in celebration of the Queen. And on the 3rd of June was the National Service of Thanksgiving for the Queen. Now, the Queen was not able to attend this service. And so right from the start, we see the Queen at some events and not at others. And so that idea of her health was a question during the Jubilee celebrations. But the celebration, the Thanksgiving service went forward and the Archbishop of Canterbury praised the Queen specifically for staying the course and for her years and years of service. The next day, the fourth was the platinum party at the palace. And this was one of my favorite moments in the Jubilee because this is the um, when the sketch with Her Majesty the Queen and her friend Paddington Bear, they shared a little tea party. And we learned for the first time 
what the queen actually keeps in her handbag. And it was probably a surprise to all of us that it is a marmalade sandwich. On the 5th, there was a Jubilee pageant that concluded that weekend of celebrations. And the queen made a surprise appearance on the Buckingham Palace balcony that day. And you could see her there waving to the crowds who were singing to her. And she she did look quite emotional and sort of overcome with the notion of all these people celebrating her and singing to her. And it turns out, of course, that balcony appearance would be very important. It would be her last appearance, her final appearance on the Buckingham Palace balcony. On the 12th of that month, she officially became the second longest reigning monarch in the world behind only Louis XIV of France. And he, after all, became king when he was four years old. But Queen Elizabeth II, second longest in the world, and of course, by far the longest reigning monarch in British history. Now, as we move into the fall, there's a lot of chaos going on. And um, the summer, of course, saw a lot of political chaos. So as we move into September, we see the Queen on the 6th of September meeting with outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Chaos, chaos, chaos. Controversy, controversy. <clears throat> and incoming Prime Minister Liz Truss. More chaos more controversy, and it would turn out to be quite ironic that that, of course, is the final duty we see the Queen perform, her final official duty, saying goodbye to Boris Johnson, welcoming in Liz Truss. And spoiler alert, that didn't last long either. Then, on the 8th of September, and I don't know if you were watching, I got my first alert on Twitter that something was happening and senior members of the royal family were hurrying to Balmoral. And uh, you could tell something was going on. I turned on BBC. I was also following it on Twitter. And that evening, the 8th of September, the death of Her Majesty the Queen was announced. Her eldest son, Charles, who was, was the Prince of Wales, became King of the United Kingdom and Head of the Commonwealth of Nations. And that did happen immediately upon the death of the queen. And there were reports that when the death was announced on the news, that crowds that had gathered in various places either cried out, God save the king, or began singing the national anthem, which for 70 years has been God save the queen. It's still a little bit of a surprise to me when it's now they're singing God save the king. But that happened immediately, of course. Then on the 10th of September, something really important, a historic ceremony that has been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years, that at St. James's Palace and at the Royal Exchange, both those in London, Charles is officially proclaimed King Charles III. And so his official name became known at that time, King Charles III, and that proclamation was made on the 10th of September. On the 11th of September, the Queen's coffin left Balmoral and traveled to Holyrood House in Edinburgh, where people were able to file past the coffin on the um, 12th. And also, the King addressed Parliament for the first time as King. Then on the 13th of September, more people were able to pass by the Queen's coffin at St. Giles Cathedral. And then the coffin later that evening traveled to Buckingham Palace, where on the 14th of September... The coffin came to Westminster Hall for the Queen's lying in state, and it's estimated nearly half a million people actually came and paid their respects to the Queen over those days. Um, you may have seen on the news the lines just went on for miles. Sometimes they would stop the lines because they were so long, um, but so many people came to pay their respects to the Queen. And her funeral was held on the 19th of September, a state funeral held at Westminster Abbey. And then the committal service was held at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. And this is the first time that the public was able to see the committal service, which was broadcast as well as the funeral being broadcast. And so to me, with this committal service, it was really very emotional 
to see the emblems, to see the royal emblems, the orb and the scepter and the imperial crown literally removed from the king, from the queen's coffin where we had seen them and placed back on the altar. And then we saw the staff broken. And it was just a very poignant moment there. And then in early October, Buckingham Palace announced that the coronation of King Charles and Queen Camilla would be a joint coronation and will take place on the 6th of May in 2023. So just a few months from now. And things sort of continued to be a little controversial during the year, of course, in Later in October, Liz Truss, Liz Truss resigned, and we had the third prime minister in a year. And King Charles, actually, in just the first few weeks of his reign, has now had two prime ministers. So he's off to a swift start in terms of prime ministers. In December, King Charles, Queen Camilla, and many members of the royal family attended the Princess of Wales's Together at Christmas concert. And, of course, on Christmas Day... The King's Christmas Address, his first Christmas Address, was broadcast to the nation. So it was quite a year in terms of the British royal family. When you think of the beginning of the year, January starts off the Jubilee year. February is the official anniversary of her accession to the throne. And then on Christmas Day, it is King Charles who is delivering that address. So it was an emotional and important sort of a roller coaster of emotion year, but one that I think we will look back on as, as Tracy Borman said, as being incredibly significant and pivotal in the history of the British monarchy and the royal family, and especially the House of Windsor. So we'll all watch together as preparations are made for the coronation and see what we can learn and look forward to. But we don't want to leave looking back at 2022 without some other favorites. And so I thought it might be fun to look at some of our favorite books from 2022. Now, these came from some different sources. So I have some of my own favorites and also some recommendations from Waterstones, a British bookstore that I just love. Also Smithsonian Magazine, some of my friends, some other podcasts, Susanna Lipscomb. So I've collected a few. I have come up with in absolutely no particular order 10 really great books from 2022. And that doesn't mean that's all of them. There are all kinds of other great books in 2022. I would like to share these 10 with you. Okay, first of all, I do want to apologize. I know my voice is a bit scratchy, but on we go. So the first book I want to share is The House of Dudley by Dr. Joanne Paul, which is, you know, she was on the podcast, which was so kind, but it just shines a spotlight on on that amazing family, the Dudley family, who throughout the Tudors are just on the brink of brilliant success and also the brink of horrific disaster, and they keep coming back and doing it again. So every Tudor monarch had a Dudley by their side. It's just fascinating how important this family is, generation after generation, throughout all of the Tudors. So there was Henry the Seventh and... Dudley, who was executed at the beginning of the reign of Henry VIII, but then more Dudleys in the reign of Edward VI. And then they advanced Jane Grey, who was married to a Dudley. So they were in trouble during the reign of Mary. But then, of course, at the end, we have Robert Dudley with Elizabeth I. So it's just this amazing, I've heard it referred to as generations of failed or even felled favorites. So it's a fascinating family. And Joanne Paul does such a wonderful job of bringing this family to light so that you can really take a look and get to know them as people. So highly recommend. Another is Blood, Fire, and Gold, the story of Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici by Estelle Perronc. And this is an amazing story of these two women looking at them together. And that's one of the great things that Estelle does is she brings them together. So you're looking at Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici, how they navigated um, in both cases, courts full of men, how they navigated the marriage question, how they interacted with each other, what it meant to be a queen, what it meant to be a consort. So they have their individual legacies that we often look at, but this brings them together. And it's a new way of looking at these women. And it's 
fascinating to see them as um, companions, as potential relatives, both very much involved in the story of Mary, Queen of Scots. I mean, it's just fabulous. And their relationship, their rivalry, their two nations that followed their lead. It's it's just a remarkable story and an absolutely wonderful book. So again, please get that. And I will have all these books in the show notes, by the way. Um, Then we come to a little bit later time, The Siege of Loyalty House by Jesse Childs. And you know, I love Jesse Childs and her earlier book on God's Traitors, which is wonderful. And this one looks at a particular house, Basing House in Hampshire, that was besieged three times during the revolution in England. And so the idea of the roundheads and and the parliamentarians working against the royal family, fighting against the royal family. And it's such an important household and family. And it became the king's principal garrison, Basinghouse did. And so which side are they on and how will things end up? And then Cromwell comes along, Oliver Cromwell in this case. It's just an amazing story. And you can really, again, get into the family and the real people in the period of time we don't often spend that much time looking at, especially, and I will admit, you know, we're often looking at the royals. So we have the royals up till Cromwell and then we skip over Cromwell and then we come back to the royals. But it is great to look at this period of time. And so that's a really great book by Jesse Childs again. Okay. Now, number four, and you can tell this is in no order because Tracy Borman, one of my very favorite people, Crown and Scepter, the U.S. edition was published in 2022. And so... We have this sweep throughout the history of the monarchy. So it's now more than 40 kings and queens who have sat on the throne. And Tracy describes them as shining examples of royal power and majesty alongside a rogues gallery of weak, lazy, or evil monarchs. That's her quotation. Isn't that fabulous? So we really get to meet and watch the evolution of the monarchy, the way power changes, the way individual monarchs respond to the events around them. It's just really remarkable to look all the way through. So from William the Conqueror and then characters like Richard II and Henry VIII and George III and Richard III and Elizabeth II and right up to now revised to include Charles III. And so this idea of of a very broad and comprehensive history where we can see what stays the same, what changes over time, and how the monarchy in Britain has survived when so many others around the world do not. So it's a fabulous story. So please get that as well. Then we have Femina by Yanina Ramirez, which goes back to the Middle Ages. And we think of Vikings and saints and kings and that patriarchal society. But here we find the story of the women and realize as, as the, again, a spotlight is shown on the women and the amazing names and the amazing people and the amazing art and the myths and the legends and and how we have in so many cases misunderstood the history and the women that start to emerge. And just a few examples, um, and I may be mispronouncing their names, some of those early names, but Jadwiga, who is a female king, or Marjorie Kemp, who has her story and sort of, you know, uses her story, and the Loftus Princess. So here we get to see some of the beginnings of Christianity. And so this is inviting us, as the description says, to see the medieval world with fresh eyes and discover the remarkable women who inhabited that world that we don't often get to meet. So it's wonderful. Another Tudor story is Tudor England, a history by Lucy Wooding. And this is the story of the monarchs that reminds us how surprising the dynasty was. Nobody thought Henry Tudor would come over and defeat Richard III. And the villages and the smaller communities, there was just constant upheaval. 
as we moved from the Wars of the Roses into the Tudors. And then it didn't immediately stop. There were all these things going on in the Tudors. And then we have the Reformation and upheaval again. And so Lucy Wooding takes us into not just the court voices, but some of the families or in the town, some of these people who weren't the monarchs. How did they live? What were they thinking? What did they write about? What was going on in their lives? And so we have monarchy changing. We had religious crisis there was war, there was plague that kept coming through, there were failed crops and starvation. So it's a very different picture of Tudor England. And related to that, we also have an illustrated sort of collection, The Tudors, Passion, Power, and Politics by Charlotte Bolland. And this is just the engagement with the international court culture. So the reformation that is ongoing in Europe and ahead of England and how it comes over and what happens when the reformation comes over to England and also what's happening throughout the world and some of the questions about the slave trade and colonialism that we often don't really delve into. So some of that theme also comes through in this book. And so we're looking at culture and religion and empire and piracy and all of those kinds of things. And some of the individuals, and I'm going to mention John Blanc as one of the individuals that we often don't get to meet in some of the other Tudor histories who does come for us in this book. So again, a great one. Um, we are now on number eight. For those of you keep, keep, keeping track by numbers, and again, I'll have all these in the show notes. The Restless Republic by Anna Kay. And this, again, is the the story of the execution of Charles I for treason and the monarchy being abolished. You know, because that doesn't last and the monarchy is restored we sometimes forget just what a moment that was. And the idea, and I love the name, the Restless Republic. England was a, a, a republic for that decade. And it's really extraordinary. And nobody knew what was going to happen and couldn't have been predicted. And because it doesn't last, we sometimes just quickly skim over it. And so this really takes us into some of the characters who were trying to shape that new republic. And it takes us out of London to some other areas around the country. And the banished royals, they were still the royalists, were still trying to, to have a place and to have a voice. And so it's just a really fascinating, it's an, it's, the whole decade was like an experiment. And that sense really comes through in this book that people didn't really know where it was going. So that's a great one. Number nine, and this is a different kind of choice. It's by Lucy Worsley, which we think of as a historian very related to the Tudors and and surrounding eras. But this particular book is her biography of Agatha Christie. And it asks the question of why she spent so much of her career sort of denying or hiding or pushing down a little bit her life, her fascinating life and her writing life and all of her mysteries and her passions. And why when she was so, as Lucy describes her as scintillatingly modern, I love that phrase, scintillatingly modern, why did she present herself as a retiring lady of leisure, an Edwardian lady of leisure, when she had all these other things going on? So it's a really fun way of looking at her and a really sort of new way of looking at Agatha Christie. We may be familiar with her mystery novels, which are so wonderful and all the adaptations of those, but we can learn so much about her from this book. So I really do love that. And I want to end with another book by someone who was generous enough to come on the podcast, Yvonne Clark, her book, Gloriana, Elizabeth I and the Art of Queenship. Um, along with Linda Collins, Siobhan wrote this book and it takes this idea of Gloriana, the Elizabeth we know, and looks at how the queen and her court used art, used musicians, used authors and playwrights 
to create this image of the queen who evolved into a type of goddess. And that was a very deliberate and fascinating decision. And what Siobhan and Linda do is take us on that journey from early portraits of Elizabeth and demonstrate through the portraiture how she changes in the way that she is presenting herself. So another fascinating look and and a unique way of looking at Elizabeth I and at that myth of Gloriana. So I want to just end with some of our top moments of Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. And again, a big thankful thank you to all of you. Our best single day of listens was just this past week, our podcast discussion with Tracy Borman. So thank you again to Tracy. One of the podcasts with lots and lots of listeners, the lots of listeners over time, is when Johanna Strong came on to talk about Mary the First and her relationships with her family members. So thank you for that. Our fiction focus that got the most attention was when we talked about the novels of Jane Austen. Um, I found some fascinating, you might want to call them frenemies, or I think of them as friendly foes. And I do want to thank both Matt Lewis and Nathan Amin for coming on. You know, Matt and Nathan don't always agree, but they still have wonderful discussions, whether it's with each other or about each other. So it's always great to hear from them. We had some specialty subjects. Um, One of our favorites was Anne Boleyn, and we had some great people coming on, Sandra Vasoli and James Peacock talking about The Falcon, and Dr. Owen Emerson and Kate McCaffrey talking about Hever Castle and Anne's Book of Hours and some of the new research done there. We had some really generous guests, and I want to thank all of the generous guests who came on, shared their time, their talent, their expertise with us. A big, big thank you. We had a really fun holiday episode. We had a few, but um, when Lara Loney t- joined us to talk about her new book, A Night Before a Tudor Christmas, really had could lean into all that holiday fun. And I was happy to begin some video episodes. And the one that seemed especially popular was the Tudor exhibition at the Met. And I do appreciate those of you who took the time to watch those videos and let me know what you thought. I'm doing some more of those again next year. We may have some more video guests as well. So again, thank you so much to all of you listeners. A big shout out, special thank you to the patrons for making 2022 Such a wonderful, wonderful year for the Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. Thank you for listening and looking back at 2022. I am so excited to spend 2023 shaking up history with you.